function. Uh, so again, they have to control the one butane dial as well. Cannabis, well, we can very quickly go over those. Um, we see an awful lot of it. Obviously, they've been up and down in the popularity states as far as the class of drug. They were class B to start with, but downgraded to C, back up to B. Uh, parts of the plant are exempt from control, in particular seeds, so you can buy seeds quite legally. Two main types of herbal cannabis, the imported grown outside in a hot climate, and the homegrown skunk variety. And really the, the skunk variety is virtually all that we see these days. That has certainly very much taken over from the uh, outdoor grown uh, herbal cannabis. That just illustrates the, the, the reduction in the popularity of cannabis resin over the last 12 years or so and the increase in popularity of skunk type drugs compared with uh, cannabis as a whole. So very much uh, skunk cannabis has taken over from um, hot climate grown outdoors cannabis. There's no shortage obviously of, of literature <coughs> to help you uh, grow cannabis. You can buy the seeds, as I said, they're not controlled if they're separated from the rest of the plant because they do have a commercial use. Hemp seeds are used commercially and you can buy seeds from all sorts of companies this is quite an old slide now, um, this Dutch company, uh, they, they're quite expensive to, to buy, but they, they, are, they then form a continuous um, source of cannabis plants because you can grow cuttings from, uh, from, from plants that you grow and so you've got a continuous supply of material. And indeed there are um, homegrown, if you like, uh, companies, uh, Sunlight Systems, that's again an old but they do still exist, I did Google them, a couple of days ago. Uh, of course they do put the little disclaimer there that um, it's illegal to, uh, to grow cannabis but it's clearly what they're supplying everything for. Um, fairly typical of a small cannabis production scene. Um, so quite often these days a whole house will be taken, will be rented and taken over, put over to cannabis production with possibly uh, thousands of plants being grown in all the rooms at the same time. If you are going to grow cannabis, that's what you want to aim for. Um, that's a mature uh, flowering female plant, which is essentially skunk. And the advantage of the homegrown skunk material is cannabis has male and female plants, uh, but you don't want the male plants because if they fertilize the female, then the THC um, level drops off uh, significantly. So you only want female plants, and the advantage, once you've identified a plant as a female plant, every cutting you take from that plant and grow will be a female plant. So once you've bought those 15 seeds, or whatever, and identified the, heart, the seven or so female plants that will grow from them, then you've as I say, got this continuous supply of female-only plants, um, and that's the sort of thing that's really easily um, attainable. Um, you can see all the, uh, the resin glands on the... Uh, the, the flowering tip here, really good quality uh, uh, skunk. I guess the difference would be that the the malaria tags tend to produce higher quantities in the in the leaves naturally than than good in cooler or in red plant. Yeah, I mean obviously the particular strains that they have cultivated now are designed <coughs> for a higher THC level, certainly in the field flowers. Yeah. So whereas uh, cannabis imported from outdoor grown material in a hot country may average about 5% THC. Skunk can easily be 10, 15 or 20% THC, so it is a really good quality product. Okay, because yeah. I think prior to that you tend to find that the, if you grow it in the same plant in a you know, more arid climate, you tend to get higher levels in plants. Yeah, yeah, you, uh, you, you could well be correct. Yeah, I, 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 I'm not good with that. Yeah, 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 I have no personal. But I don't know whether that is not, but I wouldn't argue with you. All right, Tom, I yeah. on it. Oh, right, okay. <coughs> You know more than me, then. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, let me just go back there. Um, resin, oops. Resin we don't see very much of these days, but what we do see is virtually all North African. Uh, we, 20, 30 years ago, we used to see quite a lot of Middle Eastern or um, Indian subcontinent or Southeast Asia and Southeast Asia generally, but really these days all we see are the uh, what are these sort of soaps because they're you know, about the size of a bar of soap, um, and, uh, but not a, a particularly popular product these days. There are quite a lot of other plant drugs. We obviously come across cannabis and cannabis resin already as named drugs within the Act. Coca leaf is controlled within the Act as well as cocaine itself. 
poppy straw is the opium poppy after mowing. And then we've got some type of mushrooms, we'll come across those in a little while. But so they are actually named drugs at the moment within the act of our control, but there are many others which are not controlled if they're in their natural state. That includes morning glory seeds, which can name isergamide, uh, mimosa hostilis, DMT, dimethyltryptamine, peyotecactus, it's got mescaline, <coughs> cat or chat, how we pronounce it, has got caffeinone, caffeine and caffeinone in it. Uh, they are not currently controlled if they're in their natural state. Um, Psilocybe mushrooms will grow quite happily in the UK. The little Seminaziata ones are the ones that you will find growing naturally. Cubensis are the ones that tend to be imported, or if you buy a kit to grow Psilocybe, that's what they're because they're much bigger, um, much bigger mushrooms. But they contain psilocin, a class A drug, um, and psilocybin, which is a phosphate ester of that uh, hydroxy group up there. Case law quite complicated with the mushrooms. As a result of the, uh, uh, a case involving cannabis definition, it was decided effectively in 1978 they were not controlled if they were intact. Um, and then a few years later, someone had some dried and powdered psilocybin like mushrooms, and it was decided that that constituted a preparation, and therefore they were controlled. Then simply, if they were deliberately dried without being powdered, they became controlled. Um, and then if you just packed and froze fresh mushrooms, that became a preparation and controlled. So they tightened up slowly over the years, the, the, uh, the law in relation to these mushrooms, until in 2005 they actually got round to, to controlling the mushrooms themselves fully within, within the act as fungus of any kind, which contains psilocin or ester of psilocin. You can buy various other products as well. These fire garrets contain muscimol, which is not controlled. Um, as I said, the mimosa contains DMT, quite a powerful hallucinogen. Um, morning glory seeds contain isergamide, which is very closely related to, uh, to LSD. The only difference being the, uh, the NN-dimethylamide. Uh, LSD is the NN-dimethylamide uh, derivative of isergamide. So that is a hallucinogen in its own right and found in Morning Glory. They're all in-law hallucinogens. They contain that um, bicyclic system. Um, so they're, they're quite different in structures, but all contain that, uh, that, that in-law group in them. The peritocactus is a phenethylamine derivative, but, but um, a hallucinogen rather than a stimulant like amphetamine or an ecstasy drug like MDMA, uh, present in the peyote cactus, and you can buy vesper buttons um, as, as the uh, uh, form of uh, uh, the drug. Now, I think if you can keep them down, then, uh, then you'll get a bit of a high. Cat, there is a, it's not controlled in the UK at the moment, the plant itself. There are certain other European countries and North America, the plant itself is controlled, uh, contains two um, uh, stimulant drugs, caffeine and caffeinone, which are both class C, but it's imported by the ton into the UK at the moment in the form of sort of bundles and such like, and there is a ready market within certain uh, communities within the UK for uh, this cat, which is just chewed, and you get this slow release of the caffeine and caffeinone um, as, as stimulants. So again, you can legally buy a cat at the moment. A quick run through drug analysis. Um, GCMS is the main tool of uh, analysis that uh, we use, but other um, techniques are available and indeed were certainly used when I was in the uh, FSS, NMR and Red and HPLC were, um, were very commonly used. Um, it, GCMS is very good for many drugs, not very good for amphetamine and ecstasy drugs because they're small molecules, you don't get a very characteristic mass spectrum but you can chemically derivatise them to confirm, but it is very good for general screening. If we look at a typical GCMS of, of a heroin powder, we talked about the possibility of various uh, adulterants being present, and A and B are paracetamol and caffeine. E is the component of interest, which is the actual diamorphine coming off at 3.59 minutes. That's the GC side of the um, analysis. If we then um, pass the um, effluent from the GC through the mass spectrometer, we can get a mass spectrum of that component at 3.59, and we can see that that's a very good match, not perfect, they never are, uh, with dimorphine. So a combination of retention time and mass spectrum confirms unequivocally that's dimorphine. NMR, not really used much these days. We used to have a stable in the FSS, but uh, 
LGC don't use NMR routinely in drug analysis, but where they need it, well, I know they use um, Kingston University um, uh, instruments there, and they buy buy in the analysis as and when uh, as and when needed. But very discriminatory NMR that shows the just the alphatic side chain protons in MDMA and MDEA. The only difference being this, me this methyl group here, and you can see how different the NMR spectra are. So it's a very powerful uh, dis discriminatory uh, technique. I'll sneak through those rather quickly because we running a little bit out of time, I'm afraid, so I won't, I won't go into the... But very, again, very useful for, for uh, GBL. Infrared, very good for differentiation between salts and bases. Um, in the fingerprint region, the hydrochloride powder and crack cocaine are quite similar, but up here in, the, uh, in, in this region, then they are quite different. The HCL bands are up here, so infrared is very good at differentiating between uh, coke base and coke HCL. A little bit on illicit drug production to finish off. Yeah, I think we've still got time. Thank you for bearing with me. Pretty much invariably amphetamine and ecstasy in the UK and Europe. Occasionally LSD and others. Um, as I said, they're quite small molecules, so they lend themselves to illicit production. And there are uh, two or three very common routes that illicit producers of uh, amphetamine will use. Indeed, the Leuchart route is the one that, uh, um, that is used uh, by the different pharmaceutical companies to make uh, Dexamphetamine, which it does have um, uh, pharmaceutical use. Uh, a lot of underground literature is available, and it's all uh, um, either underground or indeed the, these, uh, the Shulgins produced these, doc these books a couple 20 years ago. The PCAL describing uh, in detail methods for production of about 150 or so ecstasy type drugs and, and, and hallucinogens, and TCAL. Uh, uh, a large number of um, tryptamine derivatives, again, hallucinogens, so that is uh, uh, available. You can find any, you know, the internet will give you countless um, methods for production. If you start with the right precursor, it's easy to make the right finished product. So if you, make, you start with phenylacetone or BMK, call it what you will, all you have to do is alter the chemistry of that carbonyl group there by reductive amination to convert the carbonyl into uh, a primary <coughs> chain and you've gone from um, precursor to, to drug. So it's quite simple. You boil up your uh, BMK with formamide and that makes uh, an intermediate formal amphetamine and it's very simple then to boil that up with some acid and that converts it straight through in a two simple two-stage two process through to amphetamine in quite high yield. Very, very easy. Amphetamine and ecstasy, as we've already seen, are closely related chemically. So if you start with PMK, paranol methyl ketone rather than benzyl methyl ketone, whatever you do to that part of the molecule to make amphetamine, if you do it to that part of the PMK molecule, you'll make an ecstasy drug rather than, a, rather than an amphetamine drug. So just bringing the changes very slightly in the precursor leads you to, uh, to, to your desired product. I put critical in 1990 in there to remind me to tell you that the Criminal Justice International Cooperation Act of 1990 makes the supply of those precursor chemicals um, illegal or controlled without home office license. So you can't um, roll up at some chemical company in the UK and say, I'll have 10 litres of BMK, please, because uh, they won't be able to, uh, to, to sell it to you.